Rachel Elizabeth Siani was born on April 18, 1978, and graduated high school in 1996 from Ben Salem High School in Pennsylvania. Rachel grew up in a very dysfunctional home where she was raised by an alcoholic father. Her parents divorced when she was very young, and when Rachel was 11 years old, her mother sadly passed away. Nevertheless, by the age of 21, Rachel was a hardworking college student at Bucks County Community College in Newtown, Pennsylvania. She was aiming to become a therapist, but also dreamed of becoming a singer like her idol Tori Amos. But she knew that was a long shot, and she hoped to transfer to a four-year college to get a degree in music therapy. However, she needed more income to pay for school, so she began dancing at Divas International Gentlemen's Club in neighboring Bristol, Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, she would attract numerous obsessed customers as she quickly became one of the club's most popular dancers. College was important to Rachel, and when business was slow at Divas, she would do her homework in the dressing room or sometimes at the bar. Then one night, Rachel's hopes and dreams would be shattered when one man's obsession turned deadly. 35-year-old self-employed businessman John Denofa was a regular at the club and went by the name Jack. He would give Rachel and other dancers hundreds of dollars a night if they would sit next to him and just have a conversation. While he enjoyed the other dancers, Rachel was his favorite and he was known to shower her with loads of money. However, there was one major problem with this. Denofa was known at the club to have a sudden violent temper when he had been drinking too much. He would visit the club every Tuesday night and act like the world and everyone in it owed him something. Denofa's wife, Lisa, even knew about his visits to the club and would even provide him a ride. After the club would close, he would stay the night at the Econo Lodge that was located right next door. His wife was so okay with his activities that she would sometimes meet him and the dancers out for breakfast the next morning. Even with Denofa's temper, the dancers never feared him and considered him harmless. They said he was always respectful and never asked for lap dances. However, all that would change on March 28, 2000. Rachel had just finished her shift at 10 p.m. and went home while Denofa checked into the nearby Econo Lodge around 11 p.m. Rachel wouldn't stay home long and returned to the club to talk with friends. A group of employees and others, including Denofa, decided to go to Sportsters, a bar in Fairless Hills. Rachel got a ride there with a fellow dancer, and Denofa rode with another driver. Shortly before 2 a.m., Rachel and the dancer left Sportsters and returned to Divas. A little while later, Denofa also got a ride back to Divas. According to a dancer known as Kashmir, when Denofa arrived, Rachel spotted him in the parking lot and said, Oh, there's Jack. Let me go speak to him. The club was closed, and an inebriated Denofa was yelling and banging on the club's doors, so Rachel decided to help him back to his hotel room. Unfortunately, this would be the biggest mistake of her life. After she entered his room, she never made it out safe. It's unclear what exactly happened inside the room, but the theory is that Denofa made a move on Rachel, which she rejected. It's believed that the rejection angered Denofa, who then tried to strangle her. After that, Rachel was thrown through the second-story hotel room window to the ground below. Although the fall was not initially fatal, Rachel was knocked unconscious. Grainy surveillance footage from a toll booth between Pennsylvania and New Jersey captured a pickup truck matching Denofa's truck driving into New Jersey with what the authorities believed to be Rachel's body in the back. Sometime later, the same truck drove back to Pennsylvania with an empty bed. A few days later, Rachel's body was found by an ATV rider about 13 stories below the New Jersey Turnpike, just three miles from Divas. She had no shoes on and no ID on her, so the police quickly released a description to the media. Immediately, her manager from work and her ex-boyfriend quickly recognized the butterfly pendant and were able to identify her. They initially thought she had jumped off voluntarily until they found blood on the side of the bridge that matched hers and evidence of strangulation. Also wedged into the concrete on the bridge were white fibers consistent with the white sweater she was wearing that night. 
Also, the fact that she was not wearing shoes, but had very clean socks on, showed that she couldn't have been walking on the debris field road. During the autopsy, medical examiners found evidence that Rachel was still alive when she was thrown from the bridge. Investigators retraced her steps back to when she worked her last shift at Divas the night of her death. That's when they would find her car still in the parking lot. Authorities initially suspected the cook from the club, 26-year-old Jason Woods, because he was known to be obsessed with Rachel and had been constantly bothering her. He would even go as far as to tell people that Rachel was his girlfriend. This eventually led to Jason being fired a few months before Rachel's murder. However, when questioned by the police, he was adamant that he had nothing to do with her death. Homicide investigators would then get the break they were looking for when they learned that Rachel was last seen helping Denofa to his room after she saw him banging on the club's door. This incident was also witnessed by a nearby police officer who offered to help the club manager get the situation under control, but the manager said they were fine. Motel records showed that Denofa checked into room 223, and the motel clerk remembered that Rachel walked him to the room, but he never saw her leave. The night clerk at the motel said that Denofa strangely checked out sometime after 3 a.m. However, Denofa contradicted this, saying Rachel never went into the room and that she left shortly after dropping him off at the hotel. Investigators brought in a forensic team to check the hotel room, but it had been four days since John had stayed there. They were able to find fibers in the room, but they didn't match the fibers found at the bridge. In the hotel registration, Denofa wrote that he was driving a 1996 Red Dodge pickup truck. Around 3.12 a.m. on the night Rachel was murdered, a red truck can be seen on security footage driving through the toll booth. They could also see the body of a person in the bed of the truck, which looked like Rachel in the clothes that she was found in. About 25 minutes later, the truck drives back towards the motel with the bed of the truck empty. Though the footage was blurry and the police couldn't see the license plate, they had probable cause to search his truck. Upon searching the truck, they discovered that it had been thoroughly cleaned. However, when the liner in the bed of the truck was removed, investigators finally found what they were looking for, blood that belonged to Rachel. When questioned by police, Denofa said someone else must have driven his truck that night. Police then went back to the motel, and this time they questioned the man that had stayed in the room below his. He said at around 3 a.m., he remembered hearing a loud thud, but never got up to check what it was. Denofa's motel room faced the back of the hotel, where the parking lot was located. Investigators initially found a stain in the parking lot that looked like oil, but upon further investigation, it turned out to be Rachel's blood. Investigators believed that Denofa had intended to throw her body into the Delaware River, where it might have never been found. During the trial, his attorney claimed that he was somehow framed for the murder, but the jury wasn't buying it and found Denofa guilty of first-degree murder. He was ultimately sentenced to 30 years in prison with a parole eligibility date of August 2032. Sadly, this is the last photograph of Rachel Siani just hours before her murder. At the age of 26, Lynn Bush was living with her husband, David, and their two-year-old daughter, Misty, in Casper, Wyoming. On December 9, 1990, David called the police from Buttrey's grocery store parking lot to inform them that his wife had been missing since yesterday and that he found her 1985 Ford F-150 still in the store's parking lot. He said there were groceries in the back of the truck and her keys were found lying on the ground nearby. A receipt inside the truck showed Lynn had purchased the groceries at 5.30 p.m. the day before. David claimed he didn't report his wife missing sooner because he thought she had left of her own volition to get back at him for his marital infidelities. But Lynn's loved ones never believed his story and felt that Lynn would have never abandoned her young daughter. There was also testimony from witnesses who say they saw David speeding away with large bags in the back of the couple's truck the day before she officially vanished. 
Four days later, on December 13, 1990, police officers served David with a search warrant and seized the pickup truck. They searched the truck and found what appeared to be bloodstains throughout the cab. Officers also sprayed luminol inside the truck and found a large amount of blood on the passenger side. When officers searched the Bush home, they found blood on a vodka bottle as well. And when all the samples were tested, they matched Lynn's DNA. David had made very strange comments in the past that caused Lynn's family to suspect him immediately. He had bragged about being able to commit the perfect murder and said he could dispose of a body where no one would find it. After Lynn disappeared, Misty was removed from David's custody and placed in the legal custody of the Wyoming Department of Family Services and the physical custody of her maternal grandparents. Once Misty was in their care, they began to observe some unusual behaviors and sought treatment for her at Northwestern Mental Health Society in Sheridan. Lynn's parents eventually fought for full custody of Misty and were successful. In 1999, since Lynn hadn't used her social security number since her disappearance, the courts declared her legally dead. During the investigation, David would be charged with several crimes unrelated to Lynn's case, including burglary, voter fraud, and possessing a false ID. But it would take 15 years before he would be charged with Lynn's presumed murder. On July 31, 2006, David was arrested after authorities uncovered new evidence. While David was serving time for his other crimes, he allegedly admitted to cellmates that he did, in fact, murder Lynn. On top of that, David had other suspicious activities that didn't play well in his favor. Not long after Lynn's disappearance, he moved his mistress in with him and then had her forge Lynn's name on some legal documents. Also, someone who served with David in the National Guard said he had taken several items from the unit, including two body bags around the time Lynn disappeared. Misty's counselor and child psychiatrist also testified at the trial and said that Misty was suffering from PTSD due to her mother's disappearance. In 1991, 1992, and 1993, while Misty was in treatment, she made multiple statements that she may have witnessed her father murder her mother. But by the time David went to trial, Misty was 18 years old and testified that she had no memory of her mother's murder or anything that happened in 1990 because she was only two years old at the time. While Misty didn't have any memories of the murder, Lynn Gordon, a licensed professional counselor, was allowed to testify in court. Miss Gordon testified that Misty had talked about her mom being murdered and spoke of the gruesome details. At one point, Misty said that Daddy had hurt Mommy and gave her an owie. She also told Miss Gordon that her mother was where the Christmas trees are. One time, Misty used a toy knife to act out how her mother was killed. Misty spoke a lot about the murder in detail when she was a child, but the details are too gruesome even for this video. In the end, David was convicted of second-degree murder in March 2007. He appealed his conviction in 2010, suggesting that it was actually his brother who killed Lynn. He alleged that the court had improperly excluded evidence that would have implicated his brother. Authorities stated that David's brother, who has since been imprisoned for sexually assaulting a 15-year-old girl, wasn't even in Wyoming at the time of Lynn's disappearance. When appealing his conviction, David claimed the district court violated his constitutional right to confront the witnesses against him and abused its discretion when it permitted two witnesses to testify about statements his daughter made to them during counseling and two other witnesses to testify by video teleconference. He also claimed the district court violated his constitutional right to present a defense when it prohibited him from introducing evidence of an alternative suspect. Finally, he claimed the state violated his right to due process when it waited over 15 years to file charges against him. But his conviction was upheld, and as of February 2023, Lynn has never been found, and David remains behind bars.
Susan Galvin was the oldest of eight children, and when she was 20 years old, she moved from Spokane to Seattle, Washington. Once in Seattle, she became employed as a records clerk at the Seattle Police Department. Susan was a hard worker and very reliable, so when she didn't show up for her graveyard shift on July 10, 1967, those who knew her became very concerned. Susan was reported missing, and by July 12th, an investigation into her disappearance had begun. The next day, July 13th, 1967, Susan's body was found in the parking garage elevator at Seattle Center. The garage, which had been closed for several days, provided access to an elevated walkway above the street, which Susan used to get to the bus that she would take to work. Susan was found sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Numerous possible suspects were questioned, including a professional clown called Punchy, who strangely quit his job at the center just a few days after her disappearance. Susan spent much of her free time at the Seattle Center and was last seen with Punchy in the area where the Seattle Center Armory now stands. Despite having DNA evidence from the crime scene, her case would go unsolved for nearly 52 years until genetic genealogy research. In 2002, investigators retrieved Susan's clothes, which had been preserved in evidence for over three decades, and sent them to Washington State's crime lab for DNA analysis. The DNA failed to return any matches from CODIS, but with the help of genetic genealogist C.C. Moore, a suspect finally emerged. Tracing the DNA all the way back to the 1820s, she was able to map out a family tree and identify the suspect as Frank Whippick, Investigators discovered that Whippick still had children living in the area, and they gave their consent to collect a DNA sample, which was then submitted to the lab for comparison against the suspect's DNA. Meanwhile, a latent print examiner with Seattle Police, with only a name to go on, began digging into an old evidence file to find fingerprints retrieved inside the elevator where Susan was murdered. She was able to match a palm print recovered from the elevator control panel and lifted during initial crime scene processing to those taken from Whippick in 1971 when he was arrested for larceny. To prove even more that he was a match, his body was exhumed, and in 2019, authorities were able to match the DNA in his bones to the male DNA from the crime scene, officially solving the case. Whippick had never been considered a suspect in the case, Still, he later went on to commit more crimes in the 1970s, including larceny in 1971, and in 1975, he was accused of impersonating a police officer and making traffic stops, all while armed with a gun. He and his wife divorced in 1971, the year of his larceny conviction, which he served nine months in jail for. Though he was charged in the impersonation case in 1975, he was never convicted. Whippick was a 26-year-old former soldier employed as a security guard at the time of the murder. He died 20 years later in 1987 due to complications from diabetes. The man who worked as Punchy was located in Utah in 2016 when a Seattle police detective reopened the case, and using DNA, they were able to eliminate him as a suspect. Authorities are now looking into whether Whippick may have killed anyone else while stationed in New York Alaska, and Germany while in the Army. While it took over 50 years to solve the case, at least Susan's surviving family now has some closure. Mary London was born developmentally disabled and grew up in foster care. At the age of 17, Mary was a sophomore at Sacramento High School in California. On January 14, 1981, Mary attended school, and afterward, she went to a friend's house. Mary later left her friend's house to go and visit someone downtown. That friend would see her get on the city bus, and a separate witness would see her get off the city bus in downtown Sacramento at 8th and K Streets. That was the last time Mary was ever seen alive. The next day, her body was found by a passerby in a rural area along San Juan Road. She was found wearing only white socks and one shoe. She had been stabbed to death and was sexually assaulted. DNA from the assault was collected and preserved. 
Her half-sister, Esther Schneider, would learn of Mary's death that same night on the Channel 40 News. Sadly, the case would go unsolved for the next 40 years. When her case was reopened in 2016, detectives reached out to the public for help, identifying a man known as Daryl, who was wanted for questioning. They also entered her killer's DNA into CODIS, but there were no matches. Finally, after submitting his DNA to CODIS, the police determined that Daryl did not murder Mary. But the Sacramento Police Department refused to give up on the case, despite it being cold for decades, and turned to advancements in DNA technology and the use of genetic genealogy. Finally, in 2020, her killer was identified as Vernon Parker. Ironically, in 1982, the year after Mary's murder, Parker was stabbed to death as well, just a block from where Mary went missing. Detectives learned during their investigation that Parker had been involved in sex trafficking and a prostitution ring and wasn't much older than Mary at the time of the murder. Parker was never even looked at as a suspect, and to this day, it's unclear if Parker and Mary knew each other. Heather Porter was born in 1968, and at the age of 13, she was living on Hazel Avenue in the Woodlawn area of Hallathorpe, Maryland. Heather had a passion for art and drawing and was a huge Paul McCartney fan and would even bake a cake each year for his birthday. On the evening of September 22, 1981, Heather went missing after last being seen by her close friend, 14-year-old Sue Yutsey. The girls had been walking in their neighborhood together until Sue had to go in a different direction to her home. Heather, now walking alone, would never arrive home and was never seen alive again. The next day, a man walking his dog would stumble upon her body in a wooded area near Ridgewood Road and Goucher Boulevard in Towson, Maryland, several miles from her neighborhood. The condition of her body led investigators to believe that she had been dragged into the woods where she was sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Sadly, despite the suspect's DNA collected at the scene, the case would go unsolved for the next 40 years. Finally, cold case detectives, along with help from the FBI, as well as Bode Technology and the Hackerman Foundation, authorities would zero in on one man. After getting permission to exhume the man's remains from the Baltimore County Cemetery, police sent his DNA off for lab testing. Those results matched, and Heather's killer was identified as John Anthony Patrika Jr. However, Patrika died in 2000, leaving behind a trail of destruction, including numerous sexual assaults over the years. Patrika had been arrested on sexual assault charges in the 1960s and 70s and lived in the 100 block of Ridge Avenue, a short distance from where Heather was last seen. Her childhood friend Sue, now 56, said she routinely called the department for years to keep pressure on the detectives to solve the case. 